in glass session. So today we'll talk about heat engines, which is still the basis of all of our electrical power base load on the electrical grid and uh, still the most reliable, most uh, widespread depended upon propulsion source, meaning planes, trains, and automobiles, we're still using heat engines. So to power our iPhones, to power my laptop, to power uh, the electrical grid, and to for transportation from uh, just personal travel, shipping, industry, all of that relies on heat engines. And what a heat engine is, is you have some high temp source of high temperature thermal energy that you run in, uh, that is a, the highest energy source. Then you get some mechanical workout to do this uh, propulsion and or electrical generation. And you can run it in a cycle to get in a compact size a uh, steady output of work. The problem is most of that gets lost to the surroundings. But despite that, we still are, uh, have not replaced this source of mechanical work. So for the ideal heat engine, what we'll have is all reversible uh, stages, all reversible stages. That's what makes it ideal. The second is we run a working fluid that is ideal gas. That's another thing that makes it ideal. Thirdly, to simplify the analysis, we'll have constant heat capacities. And when we do this, uh, so those are the, uh, the assumptions we're going to use. And the actual steps we're going to use is uh, the Carnot cycle. So heat engines that we've learned in class have these certain specific uh, stages in terms of isobaric, iso, iso uh, same volume, isochoric, isothermal. Here we have another set of stages that are specific to the Carnot cycle. And these specific set of stages actually would give you the most mechanical work for these given temperature range you are at. So, um, this is another, another uh, characteristic of this cycle which makes it ideal because what we're doing is we have a high temperature reservoir of thermal energy. That is what we need. That's what we, we harness in a gasoline cylinder. We burn the fuel and air. We get a high temperature. That's the highest energy that we need for the mechanical work. A turbine engine either in the jet fuel propulsion or uh, natural gas per, um, turbine engine for electrical generation, we burn these fuel-air mixtures to get this high enthalpy, which we can get mechanical work in a cycle. And these external uh, sources of energy in the Rankine cycle, we either burn coal to boil water or we run a nuclear reaction to boil water those are all heat engines where we have a high temperature source of energy. And in this case, this um, Carnot cycle is specific to the fact that we have these um, temperature branches that we're operating around. So by the ideal gas equation, we could have um, ideal gas P little v equals R T where V is one over mass. I mean V over mass. And um, if we manipulate this equation and we keep temperature constant, we have the temperature for an ideal gas. Let's call this a high temperature is the pressure uh, times the volume. over R. 
So to keep the temperature constant, both the, the, um, the pressure and the volume have to change. So in other words, this is TH. To keep that constant, this ratio has to adjust. So if this is the dependent variable, P as a function of V would be P equals RT over V. That's why this line looks like this uh, 1 over X formulation here. So both of these, this is a constant temperature. And to keep this constant, te at this constant temperature, we have 1 over V. So P as a function of V is uh, 1 over V to, with the temperature constant. And this is a uh, one nice example of a heat engine. And with these assumptions here and the series of steps, we're going to show that this gives you uh, the most work you can get out for a given temperature branches. So this would be TH and this would be T cold. T hot, T cold. That's what all heat engines do. Uh, they have this high temperature thermal energy source, combustion products, nuclear reactions, some, and some other um, less common examples like concentrated solar. You have this high temperature and the downside to heat engines is that even though you can get some mechanical workout in a compact size in a very reliable manner that we still depend on, the downside is that most of the energy that comes in from this high temperature thermal reservoir gets lost to the surroundings and it's no one has been able to avoid that so far. So this heat engine, it operates explicitly um, around a high temperature branch and a low temperature branch. And we're going to apply this reversible stages. So the first step is let's start here at this high pressure, high, um, the, the, the high temperature is a constant, but this would be the highest energy, high pressure stage. And then once we're at this high pressure, high temperature stage, we stay at the same temperature, which is not physically possible actually. But what happens is, so this will be our heating stage where we are at high, high energy, but we take in more energy by, and then we expand. So here is where we take in some thermal energy in this stage. The, the, the unique thing about this is that it's not physically possible, but it's the theoretical limit. So whenever you have heat transfer in physical real life, you have to go from high temperature to low temperature. That's the only way energy would propagate, uh, would be from hot to cold. Here, we're taking the theoretical limit where some reservoir at TH transfers energy into the working fluid ideal gas at the same temperature, at T hot. So these are both uh, the same temperature and they transfer energy from one to another. That's impossible, but that's what makes this Carnot cycle the theoretical limit. It's you can transfer energy by heat transfer from hot to hot, basically, T hot to T hot. That is one reason why it's reversible. It's a theoretical limit because anytime you transfer heat, that's irreversible. You have to go from hot to cold you're never able gonna go to, from cold to hot. Here in the Carnot cycle, we're taking the theoretical limit where we do transfer energy from hot, high temperature thermal reservoir at some heat transfer into this working fluid, which starts at T hot and ends at T hot. So those are the two weird things is that you're transferring energy from hot to hot and that temp temperature stays the same, which, um, is possible as long as you can compensate with some uh, expansion. So uh, that's what's happening here. It's it's in from one to two. It's in adiabatic reversible um, 
or it's, an, it's not a heated bag. There's heat in. It's a reversible because it's going from the same temperature to the same temperature. T-hot to T-hot. That that's the theoretical limit of reversible. And it's heat in with expansion. So the temperature can stay the same if you bring in heat in, if you expand. So that's, um, you can do that in real life as well. The reversible part comes in with the fact that these are the same temperatures. And uh, if you draw this on a PV diagram, the pressure changes like this at the same temperature. So these are all the same temperature lines. Then from uh, two to three, you have a power stroke where uh, without lo losing any heat or changing any entropy, you have an expansion where by expanding this, this uh, volume further, you can uh, have a volume increase from two to three, which gives you some work out. And in doing so, you don't lose any heat and you go from a hot temperature to a cold temperature. So this would be from two to three, uh, adiabatic expansion. So what you're doing is you're going from the high temperature branch to the low temperature branch because of volume increased, you get some work out as well. Here's also some work out because it's, uh, the volume is increasing. Here it's without heat transfer. Um, this is Q equals zero here from two to three equals zero because it's adiabatic and it's reversible. So the ice, entropy change is zero, heat transfer is zero, the volume increases so you get work out and it brings you from the high temperature branch to the low temperature branch. Okay, that's good. This is the point of the heat engine. From this high energy source, you're able to get uh, work out. Then, to keep the cycle going, you compress to go towards where you started again. So from um, state three, at the same temperature, you get to some fourth volume. It's not the same volume, but you're getting there. And um, here, it brings in another reversibility where you have an energy loss out of the working fluid to the surroundings at the same temperature, which is a theoretical limit. That doesn't happen in real life, but we're gonna show by taking this theoretical limit you're going to reach the theoretical limit of a heat engine. So if you have um, two temperature branches, high temperature and low temperature, and um, you take this the theoretical limit where you can transfer heat in and out at these high and low temperature branches, um, we're going to show that this gives you the most work you can possibly get, um, which uh, takes these theoretical limits by doing that that gives you the theoretical limit on a heat engine so these Carnot cycle steps we're doing here is a theoretical limit for the work you can get out from a heat engine from these two temperature branches okay then we're going to go back to our uh, initial state by uh, having another adiabatic compression from state one from two state one, so this would be uh, work in to get the volume decreased from the surroundings to bring it back to the initial state. By doing that, the working fluid goes from the low temperature branch to the high temperature branch. So this would be adiabatic compression uh, so from four to one, you have no heat transfer. Okay. So this is their Carnot cycle. What makes it one of the most um, 
important points is that we are operating uh, between a high temperature branch and a low temperature branch. For ideal gas, that gives you these lines here, 1 over V, T over V, and um, that's how heat engines operate. They have a high temperature that they reach either through internal combustion process or through some external heating source. The point is that, they, that you need high temperatures. And once you have that high temperature, you can get some mechanical workout either through the turbine blades or some expansion of a cylinder like in um, these reciprocating engines then you have to keep the cycle going. And as we said, we, the only way to keep this heat engine going is you have to lose energy to the surroundings because this temperature at the end in most uh, engines does not reach the final temperature. Here in this limiting case, it does reach the final temperature. And even in that limiting case, you're still gonna lose a lot of energy that you got from the high temperature source. Some work you can get out, but you're still going to have to lose some of that energy, even in this limiting case here. So here we reach our final temperature, the coldest temperature you can. And even if you were able to bring the cycle back at this same cold limiting case, which is impossible because um, you need to get back to the original state of high temperature. How do you bring it back? Um, here is a step where we lose some of that energy by heat transfer and then we finalize that uh, to back to the original temperature by compression here. So uh, by operating around these two temperature branches we've got the most area we can to get the most work we can but um, we're despite doing that we still have this heat transfer out. So we're still going to lose some of the energy. We want the most we can to get out to mechanical work, but we still have this thing. So in any, any real heat engines, this temperature hot could be like the nuclear reaction temperature. This can be the, the flame temperature of a burning gasoline or burning jet fuel. That's the, what these heat engines operate around. T cold is literally the surroundings, the tailpipe of driving around in San Diego or uh, the cooling tower of a Rankin cycle where you typically run next to a river so that you can transfer the energy and cool the water through the river's uh, thermal reservoir. So that would be a cold temperature. So either like uh, uh, 20 Celsius or you know 70 Fahrenheit in the surroundings of a tailpipe or similar temperatures for a river in uh, next to a power plant. That's what this cold temperature would be like. So the ideal case would be where you were to take in this energy at all that energy you can at the same temperature, which is impossible, but the theoretical limit would be um, you don't need a temperature difference between hot and cold. You just transfer it all at the hottest temperature you can. Then you uh, take in that energy. Then you would expand so that you can get some mechanical work out by increasing the volume. So, and then by doing it this way, you're already at this coldest temperature that you can. To get the most mechanical work out, you're already at the final temperature. But you're not at the final state. I mean, you're not at the original state. So you want to keep the cycle going again. Here, you've expanded, and here you've expanded. So you've got some mechanical work here. But to keep the cycle going, you need to get back to this state one over here. How do you get to state one over here? You need to get to the original volume and the original temperature. That's where this second law comes in. So no one has been able to avoid this um, heat transfer step where you lose energy to, of the working fluid. So instead of it all going to mechanical work, you end up losing some of that energy in uh, heat transfer loss to the surroundings. And the best case scenario, the theoretical limit is you get your mechanical work and you end up at the lowest temperature you can. Then on top of that, 
you lose some of this thermal energy at this lowest temperature that you can. So you, it's impossible, but here the theoretical limit is you're transferring energy out from cold to T cold to T cold. So the same temperature, which is the reversible part of this. It's a theoretical limit. It, you can't achieve it in real life. Maybe you can approach it in, in a really good design. Then once you do that, you're still not at the original state. So to keep the cycle going, you compress more to get back to your original volume. And by compression, you get back to your original temperature, high temperature, then you can keep on going. Okay, so let's apply the first law to these steps to see how these um, uh, pressures, temperatures, and volumes are all related together, and then apply that to the thermal efficiency, which is, if this is a heat engine, we, the point of heat engines is to get mechanical work from a high temperature thermal reservoir. That's what we still rely upon today, to get an electrical power plant, the base load that we still need, um, we haven't been able to replace is we burn a fuel to get electrical generation. We still need that uh, for our base load. We haven't been able to avoid that. So that is a high temperature going to mechanical work. Okay, that's what we want. What do we need to do it? We need a high uh, temperature reservoir where we can transfer energy in. Uh, so let's see how that would work for these particular steps. For, so for a Carnot cycle, from one to two, you would have the first law would be the mass flow rate. Um, yeah, let's do this in terms of enthalpy. So, if we model this, um, the enthalpy change using the heat capacity, so depending on our working fluid, we can have a heat capacity and um, we can use a heat capacity and related to temperature change to get the energy change. But if this is an isothermal heat in, um, dt equals zero. So there's no internal energy change. So that means from one to two, the heat transfer stage from one to two equals the work transfer stage from one to two. And if this is an ideal gas, uh, we can relate the work transfer to the integral of PdV from one to two. For ideal gas, that is the integral of RT over V dV from one to two. So, if we remember for isothermal, that is RT, the integral of 1 over V dV, because temperature is constant here. This is hot temperature. So, going from, um, there's no change in temperature going from 1 to 2. Because there's no change in temperature, there's no change in internal energy. Then, um, if you have an ideal gas, you can relate the fact that pressure changes with RT over V. And if T is constant, that simplifies the integral. So here, uh, from 1 to 2, the heat transfer stage has to balance with some work transfer stage because uh, there's an increase in volume. And uh, if the temperature is constant, we can get this classic isothermal work term 
where uh, if the volume is bigger, so V2 is bigger than V1, so that means work one, two is greater than zero, so that's good, work out, that makes sense. Because the volume increases, you get work out here. But uh, with this ideal gas, this ideal isothermal theoretical limit allows you to simplify this integral. Uh, this, so the isothermal gives you no internal energy change. This isothermal gives you this relationship between PDV and because there's no en uh, internal energy change, Q equals W. So that gives you this here for this uh, process going from state one to state two. Okay. So let's go to the, um, from one, this is isothermal. Let's skip here to this other isothermal step, going from compression from state three to state four. So it'll follow the same um, three to four isothermal compression. You would have the first law being H4 minus H3 equals Q from three to four minus W from three to four. And if this is zero because of isothermal, dT equals zero. Zero. So that means, um, again, the heat transfer balances with the work transfer involved from three to four because there's no temperature change. Then, if we again apply um, this isothermal relationship for ideal gas, so work from three to four equals the integral of P dV from three to four. And as we just showed with this thing, this is isothermal. So this depends now on the um, cold temperature and the ratio from four to three, which um, it's now going to be a negative number because, so this let's just, um, this is going to be a negative number. Why? Because V4 is smaller than V3. So that means, um, is less than zero as well. That makes sense. That's going to be work in. So this equals work in, but this also happens to equal the heat transfer going from three to four. Okay. So we both have work in from three to four and heat out from three to four. So both of these are negative. That makes sense. This is a uh, heat in and work out. Those both should be positive. Q in is positive as well. Here we have a uh, V four less than V3, that gives you a negative value here. That means work in, that makes sense. This is negative here, that gives you negative Q, that's heat out, that makes sense. So that's good. Now, going back to these adiabatic from uh, two to three, adiabatic expansion of ideal gas and 
constant CP, CV. When you have those two assumptions, you can use this, um, these relationships here. You can say that the pressure and the volume raised to K is constant. That's what pops out of these um, under these assumptions. And uh, you could also use the temperature version of this. Temperature times volume and K minus one equals constant. Where, as we re remember, that means a constant K CP over CV. And when you have that, we can apply that to this adiabatic constant heat capacity expansion from two to three and the compression from four to one under these same assumptions, we get these ratios here. So for um, going from, let's say from two to three, that would give you I'm going to erase these. We're going to use them for 2 to 3 and 4 to 1. So if we apply those, the ratio between the volume at state 3 uh, to the volume at state two has this uh, exponent of K minus one. It's so volume three corresponds to temperature cold. So we bring that here. And um, volume two is temperature hot. So this ratio applies from two to three because of these assumptions here, where K is CP over CV. Then from four to one, we can apply something similar where um, V4 over V1, this is your initial over the final. So let's do the other way. V1 V1 is the final. V4 is the initial. So that ratio of K minus 1, in this case, this equals uh, So the hot corresponds to volume one, the cold corresponds to V4. Uh, okay, so here we're getting somewhere. Under these assumptions, because of um, these uh, constant heat capacities, we can get these simple ratios. And from there, we're gonna use these to show that by flipping this over, that V3, V2, K minus one. Let's flip this over because to bring TH over TC equals V4 over V1 K minus one. And when you do that, you can cancel out these Ks. So that means V3, V2 equals V4 over V1. Okay. 
And then when you do that, um, you'll see why we need this in a second. When you do this, you can say V3 over V4 equals V2 over V1. So why do we need that? Well, now we have a relationship between these um, heat transfer steps. So the ratio of V3 to V4, it's what happens at the heat out step. The ratio between V2 and V1 is what happens in the heat in steps. That's, what, that's what's shown here. Uh, so here, during the heat in step, the heat transfer in, the work transfer out, it's related to the ratio of V2 over V1 here. The heat out step is related to the ratio of V4 over V3 here. So that means that we can relate um, the heat transfer steps to uh, this adiabatic steps and cancel them out, basically. So let's do that here. So by using these ratios here, we're going to have this relationship that we're going to use. Where are we going to use it? We're going to use it in the um, thermal efficiency. So by definition, the thermal efficiency, it's demonstrating the design of a, a heat engine. So let's call it um, N thermal. By definition, it's what you want out, what you want to get over what you have to pay. So what we want to get is we want some work out from the fluid to the surroundings to run an engine. What we have to pay is we have the source of this energy is some high temperature thermal reservoir heat transfer. So we want work out, but that's the net work out. So we have to put in some work in here. We have to put in some uh, and, and, uh, to, to keep the cycle going. So this is by definition, the work net out. So we have to put some work in. And what do we need to pay? We need some high temperature thermal energy. Okay, we can simplify this expression by applying the first law to this whole cycle. So it's going to go from state one to state two to state three to state four back to one. So the first law has Q and W here, only W here, Q and W here, only W here. So that would be each, each for the whole cycle, there may be heat and work transfer steps involved, but uh, the enthalpy change for the cycle is zero because state one equals state one. The initial state equals the final state. So there's no change in energy. It's just an exchange in energy between heat and work transfer processes throughout the cycle. Okay, so by applying the first law analysis on the cycle, we would get that um, the heat transfer steps of the cycle minus the work transfer steps of the cycle has to balance out the mass and the um, 
energy change. But for the cycle, um, H1 So this equals zero because the initial state is the same as the final state. That's the reason why this is zero. Different, different, different reason than those. It's simply that H1 in, is the same as the, at the end, beginning and the end. But throughout these steps, you have heat transfer here, work transfer here, heat transfer here. I mean, no heat transfer, only work, heat transfer and work only work here. So this would be, um, this would be Q from one to plus zero, because there's no in through two to three plus Q from uh, three to four plus zero minus the work transfer from one to two plus the work transfer from two to three plus the work transfer from three to four, plus the work transfer from four to one. All has to balance out. That has to be zero. Okay. So here, we know that uh, uh, some of these balance out. So here we have Q, one, two equals this here, so those will be here. Then the work transfers so at the end what we'll be able to say is that uh, what we already know already it's that um, It's that Q from 1 to 2 plus whatever this Q from 3 to 4 equals So if we look at here, this is um, from one to two, this is some work out. From two to three, this is work out. From three to four, that's work in. From three to uh, all of those other steps, let me draw this. Let's go back here because this is zero here. What we're going to use is that work net out has to be the absolute value of um, the work involved from one to two plus the absolute value of the work involved from two to three minus the absolute value of the work involved from uh, three to four minus the absolute value of the work from four to one. Okay. So, what you could also say is that here, the work note um, for the cycle
So this equals uh, the heat transfer steps. So this equals Q from 1 to 2 minus Q uh, from 2 from 3 to 4. So the network out can be expressed in terms of the heat transfer steps. So by plugging those in here, let's see. So this is T hot So the thermal efficiency equals work net out over QH. This is the heat transfer in from one to two minus the heat transfer out from three to four, relating that to the cycle uh, work process steps time divided by this heat transfer in step, QH. So, under these assumptions, we're able to get these heat transfer steps in terms of these um, isothermal temperature processes. So this first one to two step was related to V2 over V1 then, uh, well, let's uh, simplify it first. So, simplifying this first, you would get Q8, Q, Q12 over Q2 is 1. So, it'll be 1 minus Q34 minus Q12. And, uh, that is one minus the cold temperature and the ratio from three to four, it's um, uh, four to three. And then R H, the high temperature, V4, V3, absolute value of that, then this would be 2, V1. And what we'll see here is that this is the same thing as saying um, So we're taking the absolute value because this is out, just that number out. That's why we put the minus sign here. That's the same thing as saying this. And from this adiabatic relationship here, um, these volumes cancel out. This is the same thing as this, the R's cancel out. So after all this analysis here, under these assumptions, these Carnot cycle steps the thermal efficiency, the work that you can get out for this heat transfer, you have to put in 
under these simplifications of these isothermal temperature branches and with the constant heat capacities allow you to cancel these out here, all you get is that the thermal efficiency only depends on the temperature branches you're operating on. So if you were to have a very cold temperature and a very high temperature, you can approach um, the theoretical limit of 100% thermal efficiency. So, you know, so here in this ideal case, reversible steps where you can transfer heat at a high temperature source uh, at the same temperature and then go to that low temperature branch after all the work is taken out and then lose that thermal energy to go back to the original state at cold temperatures and then have these adiabatic steps, constant heat capacities, the only thing left would be the thermal efficiency related to the cold temperature branch and the high temperature branch. And so if, for example, um, let's say Tc equals 1 Kelvin, and for uh, argument's sake, Th equals 1,000 Kelvin, so this is colder than a little bit, this is about the, the uh, little bit colder than typical heat engines, like an actual operating. This is much colder than any heat engine though. So this is a real life a magnitude. This is not feasible in any real everyday personal heat engine. Here we have, I have a personal heat engine. I drove to work and that ambient was like 300 Kelvin. Here, this is a typical engine's temperature. So then that would be um, Tc over Th. That will be like um, 0 0.001. 0 0.001. So here, the thermal efficiency would be... Uh, basically 0 0.999. Okay, that's great. The problem with this in real life is that, of course, you cannot transfer heat at high temperatures and keep this high temperature in the working fluid. And when you expand, you're not gonna go all the way to one, one Kelvin and then keep the cycle going. And besides that reversible limitation, and the fact that at an ideal gas, who knows what this working fluid is, for air at one Kelvin, it'll become a liquid. The ideal gas equation will no longer work. Then, what is your engine made out of? Any engine material, like a simple cylinder, will behave a lot differently at 1,000 Kelvin than one Kelvin. Real material limitations Engines work fine at 1,000 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin with, you know, some proper thermal management. Going to 1 Kelvin, that's cryogenic, cryogenic. that's close to absolute zero. Stuff freezes, and especially when you're going um, to those cold temperatures versus hot temperatures, they'll have a lot of thermal fatigue, a lot of uh, material, real material fatigue problems, phase change, thermal cycling uh, problems. Uh, so theoretically, going to one Kelvin, going to a thousand Kelvin would give you a very high thermal efficiency in the theoretical limit. But let's see uh, a more reasonable temperatures to real life, 300 Kelvin. That's our thermal reservoir for my tailpipe that I used this morning. And let's keep a typical engine temperature of 1,000 Kelvin. That's a good order of magnitude. That would give you Tc over Th of what? Like 30%, right? 0 0.3. 0 0.3. In that case, the thermal efficiency would be 0 0.7. Okay. Not bad. Not 100%, but... For um, exhaust source of 300 Kelvin that I use every day in San Diego, 
and a typical engine temperature, burning the fuels. It gets hotter than that, but 1,000 is typical because um, it's hard to uh, per avoid heat loss and all that stuff. So at the theoretical limit, assuming my gasoline uh, internal combustion engine had reversible stages, ideal gas, the thermal efficiency could approach 70%. But, of course, the, the, the limitation here is that our high temperature source of energy is bringing this in at the same temperature as your surround, as, as a high temperature. And then you get all this work out such that after you get this power stroke or this turbine stage, you're at your final temperature again. Uh, to, and then you have to exhaust. So those are all... Re reversible stages that are the theoretical limit which don't actually occur. But even that, so these are typical temperatures and our materials, our engines can r work around this temperature range. We have proper uh, metal engines with proper cooling to keep this sustainable for th hundreds of thousand miles, decades running like this fine with some proper maintenance. Even so, the theoretical limit with even those reversible stages, you're still losing 30% of that thermal energy to the surroundings. And uh, if we were to go to other real cycles like uh, Brayton cycle, Rankin cycle, auto cycle, even with some simplifications, we won't even approach this. It's tip with typical operating parameters that we we'll use in real life and depend on in real life the thermal efficiency is usually much less than 50%. So through these steps here, using the ideal gas, we're able to arrive at an expression for the Carnot cycle, which is um, from this isothermal steps at the high temperature branch and the low temperature branch, pretty much the theoretical limit for any heat engine operating between a high temperature source of energy and a low temperature um, sink for energy. A, to keep this cycle going, you always have to lose energy to this cold temperature sink. That's uh, one part of the thermodynamics. That's the second law of thermodynamics, one way to express it. Then, even with these reversible stages, you're going to have a limiting case where the thermal efficiency is simply uh, related to the temperature branches. And even so, under typical conditions, you might be able to reach 70% thermal efficiency. And you can play with these numbers to get a crazy um, thermal efficiency. Like, for example, let's go to 10,000. Let's say, okay, let's, if we're to, I don't know, let the number go from 1,000 to 10,000. Uh, TC equals 1,000. For number's sake, T H equals 10,000. That will give you a thermal efficiency of 90% or even greater, but 10,000 Kelvin is pretty hot. Nothing really goes to 10,000 Kelvin. Everything will melt or become ionized and like crazy temperatures. That's 10,000 Kelvin is not a feasible number for any material. So this gives us a nice theoretical limit. We have these. Uh, temp high temperature branch, low temperature branch, and this is getting all the energy in and out at those temperature extremes. That's how heat engines work. All real heat engines operate uh, with less area under this curve. And if we do this analysis using no heat loss here, no heat loss here, uh, all the energy from these high temperatures and low temperatures, we can get this expression of uh, related to the temperatures and even with that we're still going to lose some energy to the uh, low temperature exhaust sink okay so with that uh, see you guys next time thank you